A hundred years Rick and Morty, my god, what a season premiere. As I'm sure you know, Rick and Morty's sixth season began last night with an absolutely show-shattering episode called Solarix. And I can't believe it, but they did everything I wanted them to do and more. This is the most excited I've been about Rick and Morty in literal years. We got some deep lore and backstory, confirmed longtime theories, major status quo shifts, and a fully established ongoing villain. After the finale last year, I made a video called Rick and Morty's Finale Changes Everything, and even though I did feel like the potential after that episode was near limitless, part of me still thought that maybe the show was just going to fall back into its status quo episodic tendencies. But my god, the bastards really did it. They just absolutely exceeded all of my expectations. So let's dive in. And just a reminder, I actually have other Rick and Morty videos up on the channel as well, and a huge video on why I love Solar Opposites Wall storyline so much if you're into other Roiland works, so check those out if you want. But first, today's video is brought to you by Helix Sleep. Thanks to Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video. I'm gonna be honest, as I get older, I am having a lot more difficulty staying asleep through the night. But luckily, Helix Sleep is here to help. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs before being conveniently shipped right to your front door. But here's the thing, everybody sleeps differently and Helix Sleep understands this. So all you need to do is take their sleep quiz to match your body type and sleep preferences with your perfect mattress. Helix Sleep matched me with the Helix Sunset since I'm a side sleeper who prefers a softer mattress. And let me tell you, after using this thing for just a few weeks, it has really made a huge difference in the quality of my sleep. It's incredibly comfortable, the perfect softness level for my needs, and it keeps me resting well through the night. But you also get a 100 night sleep trial alongside a 10 year warranty. And there are even financing options and flexible payment plans. They make it really easy for you. A mattress is a big purchase and Helix gives you over three months to make sure that it's the right fit for you. I am a huge fan of my Helix mattress, and I think you'll be a fan of yours too. If you need a new bed, check out Helix. Click the link in the description or go to helixsleep.com slash two cellos for up to $200 off your Helix sleep mattress plus two free pillows. That's helixsleep.com slash two cellos for up to $200 off your Helix sleep mattress. All right, so right off the bat, the episode picks up immediately where last year's finale left off. After Evil Morty left the central finite curve and destroyed the Citadel, our Rick and Morty managed to eject one saucer from the space station, along with a handful of other Mortys. As we see here, they've since been stranded in space, and this firmly establishes our first real status quo shift as hinted at in the season five finale. The portal technology is useless now, no easy interdimensional travel, and this is a really exciting and welcomed change in my opinion. It does start to feel like the portal gun could fall into narrative crutch territory, so the fact that the writers are going to have to creatively write around this status quo shift could make things really interesting. This episode also parodies the opening of Avengers Endgame where Tony Stark is stranded in space. Been drinking a lot. Morty, I told you to write this down. I, I don't have a helmet like that Avengers guy did been drinking a lot of my piss. And much like Captain Marvel in Endgame, Space Beth shows up to save Rick and Morty from endlessly floating through the void of space. As soon as they get back to Earth, the real plot of the episode kicks in, once again a natural continuation of what happened in the season 5 finale. Because portal technology is now broken, Rick attempts to reboot the portal index. Unfortunately, instead he accidentally resets portal travelers, meaning every interdimensional portal traveler will revert to their original universe. It's everyone from this reality returning to their reality of origin. And then this fully confirms a longtime Rick and Morty fan theory about Jerry Burry, and possibly clarifies some things about it too. How did I end up not in my own universe? Oh my god, the Jerry Burry! Oh, the Jerry Burry! Deep cut. So if you're unfamiliar, this is a theory that dates all the way back to season two's Morty Night Run. The theory has been around for a while. Basically, at the end of Morty Night Run, Rick and Morty are given Jerry back from Jerry Burry before another Rick and Morty come up and ask, do you have ticket 5126, revealing that Morty lost his ticket. They then swap Jerry's. Now, this episode seems to confirm that the Jerry they got back was actually not the proper Jerry. And there's actually a bit more implied with this confirmation that I'll get to later in the episode as well. Okay, back to Solarix. So after Rick 
Rick, Morty, and Jerry all disappear back to their original universes, the Beths and Summer have to go to the Citadel to coordinate a beacon to help Rick find his way back. I really enjoyed the dynamics at play with the two Beths and Summer. As the show has gone on, Summer has become increasingly comfortable with the interdimensional adventures. She adventures with Rick almost as much as Morty at this point, so it makes sense that she seems to be drawn to the badass version of her mother, Space Beth, and wants to have a relationship with her. This also highlights really interesting insecurities in both Beths, regular Beths inferiority complex to Space Beth, and Space Beth's fear of being a mother again. So next up we see Rick return to the oft-referenced universe C-137, where we know that his version of Diane and Beth were murdered by Rick Prime. We actually hear Diane's voice for the first time too. Rick, is that you? Yeah. Diane. But it's revealed that this is just a haunting program created by Rick basically to torture himself. In addition to this, Rick trapped his entire dimension in a perpetual time loop reliving the day of the events of his family's death, which is hardcore as fuck. Right. I used to drink drink. Morty finds himself back in the universe that got Cronenberged back in season one's Rick Potion number nine, where he runs into now fully badass warrior Jerry. The last time we visited this universe was the season three premiere, the Rick Shank Redemption, where we saw these warrior versions of the entire original family, though none of them could speak full sentences at this point, which is weird, but we did see Jerry, Beth, and Summer. But this episode reveals that since then, both Beth and Summer have died and Jerry is on his own. It's pretty bleak. I really appreciated the way that Morty goes into a full guilt spiral and attempts to connect with the one member of his original family that remains. The show obviously makes the Smith families feel infinitely replaceable, but the reveal that the ones we originally met actually didn't make it kinda hits hard. And Jerry isn't really having it either. He even calls Morty out. Oh, am I cool enough for you now? Well, that was easy. It only cost me f***ing everything. Whoa, hey! Man, this is such a cool way to develop the original Jerry. Though we see variations on Rick and Morty's and the other Smiths throughout, in general, they tend to be pretty similar. To see a Jerry who has gone through and lost so much. Your mom and sister died, Morty! <sighs> and I moved on from caring. I instantly wanted him to be a recurring character, which sadly I don't see happening, but we'll get there. I also loved how this just fully broke Morty down into tears. This is such a heavy situation and revelation. After Summer manages to drop the interdimensional beacon, Rick manages to land in Morty's reality where we get another major lore bomb. It turns out the Rick from Morty's original universe is actually Rick Prime. The Rick that our Rick has been hunting down, the one who killed his family. The whole reason Rick went to that reality in the first place was to wait for this Rick to return there. That also means that our Morty's biological Rick is responsible for the death of Rick's family. This also means that our Morty's biological Rick is Rick Prime, the big villain, another heavy revelation. And on top of this, Rick's attempts to reboot the portal index means that Rick Prime also reverted back to this universe, and without portal tech, he's trapped there. This, I'm guessing, is why Rick ultimately won't reboot the portal index, because if he does, Rick Prime will be able to escape again. They go to Rick Prime's space base and attempt to take him out, but through some trickery, he's ejected in an escape tube down to Earth. Morty tries to convince Rick to just go and save the Beths and Summer, and they have this really nice moment after Rick comments about how Morty is related directly to Rick Prime. I don't know him. You're my grandpa, Rick. Rick and Morty, a hundred years. There are a few reasons that I really love this moment. Using the phrase that was just a ridiculous repetitive joke at the end of the original pilot, but in an emotional context, should not work this well. But it does. And also, on a thematic level, I love what this moment represents for our Rick. Rick finally has this opportunity to get revenge on the person who killed his family. But in doing so, he would potentially be dooming the people who became his family in the aftermath of that tragedy. It's this crossroads where he has to recognize that while chasing down this revenge, he actually gained a new version of the thing that he lost. And so they save the Beths and Summer and go ahead to grab Jerry from his original universe. And this is where I want to go on a second little tangent about the Jerry Bury theory real quick. Because I think this is actually the second time we see this version of the Smith family, the first being in season two's Total Recall. Here's why. Basically, at the beginning of Morty Night Run, when Rick and Morty drop Jerry off at the Jerry Bury daycare, we see two things. One, confirmation that this is Rick C-137 as seen on the Jerry Bury intake form. And two, that the ticket handed to Rick and Morty was ticket number 5126. So in the beginning of Morty Night Run, we know that Rick C-137 and Morty had ticket 5126, 
which the Rick and Morty who adventured with the genocidal gas cloud through Morty Night Run did not have at the end of the episode. Meaning the Rick and Morty we followed in that episode were a different Rick and Morty than the ones we normally follow. Furthermore, the episode immediately following Morty Night Run is Total Rick Call, and it shows Rick dumping a bunch of glowing green rocks in his trash. We also first saw Rick pick up these green glowing rocks during the gas cloud adventure in Morty Night Run, implying that the Rick with the green rocks is not Rick C-137, also implying that the Smith family we follow in Total Rick Hall is not the main featured Smith family. And since this is the Smith family who swapped Jerry's, that means the family we see in this scene in season 6's premiere is likely the family from Total Recall as well as the Rick and Morty from most of Morty Night Run. I know that's a lot, and honestly it's kind of inconsequential, but it is still very interesting, in my opinion. After the family returns to their dimension with everybody in tow, we get yet another major shift. They find their original season 2 Jerry at the house and he lets loose Mr. Frundles, who starts infecting everything including season 2 Jerry, turning everything into a Mr. Frundles, culminating in the destruction of the entire Earth. Meaning the family has to yet again find a new dimension to occupy, calling back to season 1's Rick Potion number 9 yet again. They even make the entire family bury their interdimensional counterparts in the backyard this time. And I love that it's the entire family, and that this means that our entire Smith crew is displaced from their original universes. Sure, Beth, Space Beth, and Summer are all from the same universe, but it's cool that this is like this ragtag family of misfit Ricks, Mortys, Beths, Summers, and Jerrys. And it's cool to see every single one of them get significant development, including now Space Beth, who wants to come around and hang with the family more often, which I really love to see. That's the kind of status quo shift I can really get behind. There's lots of narrative and character development opportunity with Space Beth, and it's cool to hear that we can expect her to just be a bigger part of the show moving forward. And then the post credit tag, fully establishes that we're going to be looking at Rick Prime as an ongoing villain for the series. Basically the new evil Morty, but with more connection to the narrative and bigger stakes for our Rick. OG Jerry slits Rick Prime's throat, revealing that he can heal like Wolverine, and he proceeds to murder OG Jerry. A really great villain moment. Now, I am disappointed that OG Jerry died because I loved him as a character and honestly sort of wanted to see him maybe have a little fling with Space Beth since they're both so badass. Sadly, it looks like he's probably gone, though it is Rick and Morty, so you never know. There's probably ways he could come back. But it is actually insane how much lore was referenced and established in this one episode and how many seeds were planted for the ongoing stories this season and beyond. We've got the major change in portal technology that, for now at least, it does not exist. Exist, making jumping universes much more complicated for both our Smith family and Rick Prime. We've got Space Beth wanting to stick around and be a bigger part of the Smith family's lives moving forward, which will likely both put her into more domestic situations and also bring more wild galactic space danger to the family. We've got the fact that they have once again jumped dimensions and now the entire family is displaced in a new reality. And of course, the firm establishment of Rick Prime as the major villain moving forward, including the revelation that he is our Morty's original Rick. On top of these seeds being planted, it just appears as though Rick and Morty is starting to really embrace its own lore and serialized elements. Now that isn't to say I think the show will abandon episodic episodes. It has to still do some episodic stuff. But if you look back, the last four episodes of the show have all been either fully rooted in character lore and backstory or contain major serialized elements. Returnal Friendshine of the Spotless Mort gives a full backstory on Rick and Bird Person's relationship. Forgetting Sarek Marshall has a serialized ending that leads directly into Rick Mirai Jack, which in turn paid off Evil Morty and revealed the full tragic backstory of our Rick in the process. And now the season 6 premiere has followed up that finale in a fully serialized way while finally embracing the show's established lore, backstory, and planting seeds for story points to come. Plus, the next episode is called Rick A Mort Well Lived, which, while it does appear just to be a fun episodic diehard parody, is also completely built around the established game Roy A Life well-lived from season two. The following episode will be called Bethic Twinstinct, which for sure will be some kind of adventure with both Beths. So it just really feels like Rick and Morty is embracing itself. This might just be the version of Rick and Morty that fans have been hoping for for years. Both Royland and Harmon have said that the show is leaning a bit more canonical this season, and I think this is an incredible start. There is so much potential with where the show is at. It's willing to change and shift things. It's establishing major villains and building them up. It's developing every character in interesting ways. While I still liked the show, seasons four and five did start to lose my interest a bit. There are probably six or so episodes that I really loved in seasons four and five. And I think that season six's premiere has just about all of them beat. 
This is, without a doubt, the best season premiere since season 3, and I am wildly excited to see what the show is going to do this season. But what do you think? Did the season 6 premiere do it for you? Are there any aspects of the story it's setting up that have you as excited as I am? Let me know below in the comments and stay tuned because I'm planning on covering each episode this season. We'll see if I can manage it. Peace. Johnny! Two challenge.